good evening and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second last lecture of today. Can everybody hear me okay at the back? Yes? Okay. Fabulous. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Morris Gleason. I am a genetic genealogist. I'm also a psychiatrist, a pharmaceutical physician, a part-time actor. I do the occasional voiceover work. I'm a jack-of-all-trades, and I'm trying to master just maybe one or two of them. Uh, but I've been involved in genealogy and genetic genealogy uh, specifically since about 2008. I run the Gleason, uh, the Farrell and the Spiran DNA projects and a couple of other smaller interest projects. And I uh, put together the uh, DNA lecture program for Genetic Genealogy Ireland as well as helping out in the UK uh, with the DNA lecture program for Who Do You Think You Are? So it's a pleasure to come here and talk to you today uh, about my own family. I'm going to talk to you about the Gleasons, and I'm also going to uh, use the example of the Gleasons to uh, help you perhaps understand uh, what is possible in surname projects in terms of reconstructing family trees. And the title is Building a Family Tree with SNPs, STORs, and main and named people. Now what we're used to doing is we're used to building our family trees with named people. But what I'm exploring is the possibility of actually substituting DNA markers for the ancestors when the named people run out. So that ultimately we have this kind of a tree. The named people are in blue. And they're starting here in say around about 1960, going all the way back into the 1400s. And some of us will have um, relatively extensive pedigrees that maybe go back to 1690 and this is just the direct male line father 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 some of us will go back about to the 1810 others will go back and, and have a, a roadblock about 1840 1870 it very very much depends but this is kind of a typical uh, Irish family tree and in our Irish um, surname studies what we find is that we end up with a lot of uh, trees going back to about 1800, then the records run out and we're left with perhaps DNA instead as the opportunity to connect these people together. So it's all about using DNA markers when people run out. And the big question is, is it possible? There's the brick wall. Can we actually get beyond the brick wall and discern the branching pattern of our overall family tree going back to when the Gleasons first arrived or the Doherty's or the Morgans or the Spearns or any other surname when it, went, when it first arose in Ireland around about 900, 1000 AD? Is it possible to actually at least have the branching pattern of that tree even if we can't put a name in every single box? Can we put DNA markers there instead? So that's the question that I asked myself with uh, the surname projects that I'm running. And we're just going to look at the Y DNA in this presentation, father, father, father line. We're not looking at any other uh, ancestral lines. Here to remind you is the Y chromosome. When we unravel it, it forms that double helix. It's got these uh, bases along the bottom. They're G, C, A, and T. G always binds with C, A always binds with T. That forms the basis of the genetic code. And the main take-home message from this slide is that there are two types of DNA marker. The first one is the STR marker, and the second one is the SNP marker. And we'll be talking about both types during the presentation today. The STR marker is a repeat of several bases, TAC, 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 which you see here. So this particular marker has a value of three, because there are three repeats. The SNP marker, on the other hand, is just a single substitution. This perhaps should have been a, a G, where you can see that an A has been substituted in there instead. Very important distinction between the two types of marker, you have about 500 STR markers on the Y chromosome, you have about 50,000 SNP markers on the Y chromosome. So there's a, there's a thousand times, no, there's a hundred times more SNP markers than, they are, than there are STR markers. So there's the potential there that they give us a lot more granularity, a finer detail. Now, SNP markers have been used very extensively to study human migration out of Africa uh, 50,000 years ago and spreading across the globe. And this was when we had relatively few SNP markers identified. But of course, in the last couple of years, there's been a tsunami 
of SNP markers discovered and it's allowed us to get a lot more granular and discover a lot more of the finer downstream branches of the human evolutionary tree. Um, so that's the top-down approach. That human evolutionary tree is getting further and further away from Africa 50,000 years ago and it's getting very, very close to Ireland 2,000 years ago. So it's coming up into a genealogical time frame, into a historical time frame. So this top-down approach of human evolution is beginning to meet what we are doing, which is the bottom-up approach of genealogy. And that's why it's particularly exciting to try and explore this interface between the two movements. Um, there is a variety of SNPs. Here's just a, a, an example of the tree as it has uh, progressed. Um, finer and finer branches. A couple of years ago I was L21, then last year I was Z255. Now I'm even further downstream from that marker uh, today. And I'll show you some of those results for the Gleason DNA project. So new markers help define the finer branches of the human evolutionary tree. When you do a YDNA 37 marker test, like you might buy outside at Family Tree DNA, and if you are thinking of buying a DNA test, incidentally, I'd advise you to do it after this lecture, because they're going to be closing down the uh, main hall at around about 5.30, uh, so it will be a limited amount of time before they come in here and take everything down here as well. So I will be trying to gain a little bit of time, so excuse my speed in talking to you, uh, because Brad will be the last lecturer, and he's going to tell us about the future of genetic genealogy, and I'd hate not to find out what the future is and not give him a chance to finish. I want to know what my future holds. So I will be running through this very quickly. This is what a surname project looks like. So, for example, you have all the markers along the top, you have the various members here. I like to think of it as a stack of Y DNAs, a stack of Y chromosomes. And all along the Y chromosome, you have the markers here. These are the STR values for each individual stacked on top of each other. And you can see that they're all identical. It's only when you get out here that you have the occasional mutation. This indicates that these individuals are very closely related to each other. Now, there's a couple of features. Uh, the first 12 markers panel are called panel 1, and they're markers 1 to 12. The, s the second panel is marker 13 to 25. The third panel is marker 26 to 37. Um, these are the mutations here. The fast mutating markers are indicated by maroon or dark red coloration uh, uh, up here. So if you, uh, this is a very good way of identifying what is a fast mutating marker and what is not. The other thing that's worth noting is the minimum, the maximum, and the mode. Now, um, uh, the, me the mode is the most frequent value. You may not be too familiar with that. The mean is the average value. We don't really are not interested in that. Median is the middle value, but the mode is the most frequent value. And you can see here that everything is here is 15, so the most modal value will be 15. Uh, over here, we've got a few mutations, but the modal value is still 33, with the occasional 34 uh, thrown in. So the most frequent value is uh, 33 on that side. That's what the modal value is. The modal haplotype refers to all of these modal values across here. And the importance of the modal haplotype is that it probably represents the genetic signature of the common ancestor to that entire group. Probably. I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time it would do so. Maybe a bit less than that. I see James Irvine shaking his head, and then when I say no, he says yes, that's correct, no. Um, so it may not be, be that frequent. I guess we just haven't done as much research on, on how frequently it occurs that way. Um, and it will be biased, and it will be skewed. Uh, because, of course, we are the survivors of the ancestors. So there may have been population bottlenecks, a variety of other things that made some branches of the family die out that were perhaps more representative genetically of the common ancestor. So we may very well be seeing a skewed um, uh, version of the ancestral haplotype. But that, the modal haplotype is a very important consideration. Always compare new members to the project 
to the member that is closest to or exactly matching what you have as the modal haplotype. That is a general rule of thumb because that helps decide whether or not they should be included in that particular surname project. At least that's the way that I operate. Uh, I know some project managers are slightly different. <laughs> Don't worry about reading this. I'm just showing this to you for the nice colors. And the nice colors are very important because you can see here that there's a completely different color pattern in lineage one of the Gleason surname project to lineage two. Uh, here's a long line down here. It's a, it's a different color down here. Here are two long lines here in orange on, in lineage one. They're missing in lineage two. Lineage two has these two blue lines here. Um, there's a little bit of one there, but it's large. This one here is missing in lineage one. The point is that the um, types of mutations you get help define this distinctive um, marker value pattern for each of the lineages that tells you that lineage 1 is very different from lineage 2. Now, I can tell you that in the Gleason project, everybody in lineage 1 is descended from a single individual, and his name is Thomas Gleason, and he was born in 1609 in Cockfield in Suffolk. It is an English line. It is not an Irish line. Lineage 2 are the North Tipperary Gleasons. And that's typically in Ireland where the Gleasons come from. Are there any Gleasons in the audience or anybody with Gleason ancestry? One, two, yes, well, three now. Um, there's a saying in North Tipperary, if you throw a stone, you'll hit a Gleason. It's an observation, not a recommendation. <laughs> So, and that, so that is where Gleasons are very, very heavily concentrated. Now, why do we group people together? And the answer is because different pieces of evidence point to the probability that they are all closely related. And I'm uh, throwing out this term, markers of possible relatedness. And DNA is just one of those. So I put together these criteria for the Farrell project that I inherited earlier this year. And I said, what indicators could possibly uh, suggest that the people were possibly related to each other? First one, of course, is that two, two members of your project share the same surname. You're at Gleason, I'm at Gleason, hey, maybe we're related. We share the same surname. It's a marker of possible relatedness. Genetic distance, then, turning onto a, the, the, the genetic markers are in orange or red, but genetic distance is one, and that's the uh, distance between two members. If it's, if it's zero, or one, or two, at 37, I don't know what that was, um, then it indicates that there was possibly a very close relationship between uh, these two people. Similarly, um, as James has uh, talked about in his lecture, a tip score of, let's say, greater than 80%. Uh, also suggests that the two people are very closely related to each other. If two people share uh, the same rare marker value, that can also be a very indicative indication that these people are possibly related to each other. Also, if the results of SNP testing are consistent with each other. You know, you don't want to have, if you have two people who are on separate branches of the human evolutionary tree that were, was connected 10,000 years ago, then they can't be related to each, each other in a genealogical time frame. You need to check to see whether the SNPs of two people, if they have been tested, are consistent. It doesn't matter if one is upstream and one is downstream, as long as they consistently appear to be on the same branch. But if you've got two people on branches that are far flung, then they are not related to each other. The same surname variant, so you can get at least with two E's, you can get at least with an E and an A, you can get a Farrell, a Farley, a Frawley. The same uh, surname variant is present among two people. That's again suggestive. The same uh, location, the place that they came from. You saw that for Gleason lineage 2, they all came from Tipperary. That tells you that they're closely related potentially to each other. And e ultimately, if they have the same common ancestor, two members of your project with the same common ancestor, well then, they probably are very related to each other indeed. So when I applied these markers of possible relatedness, or MPORs, I just had to invent my own TLA, three-letter acronym. Um, when you look at these MPORs and apply them to the Farrell project, and, but we're just going to use one. We're going to use genetic distance, and this is the threshold 
for genetic distance that is set by family tree DNA. It's relatively arbitrary, but it's, it's as good as any. Um, my suggested approach would be to use genetic distance as your first guide as to whether or not two members should be lumped together in the same project. Um, and for those members who are probably or only possibly related, use the TIP tool, um, greater than 80%, greater than 90%, greater than 60%. You choose your own uh, cutoff uh, then to, to decide whether these outliers should be included in the main group or not. Um, I developed this method of dividing those on the periphery into a kind of a, a B group, and my A group is the core. So you'll see in my Farrell project that I have genetic family 1A, which is the core group, and genetic family 1B, which accounts for the outliers, who would perhaps skew the modal haplotype if I included them in the core group. Uh, so in the Farrell project, I grouped people on the basis of genetic distance alone, and they fell into these separate genetic clusters here. The interesting thing is, the same surname variant occurred in genetic family 1 and genetic family 2. This is a bunch of Farleys, this is a bunch of Ferrells. So we're getting independent verification that a second marker of potential relatedness is turning up in these projects when you have uh, just uh, grouped them on the basis of a totally independent variable, namely genetic distance. The second thing to notice is that one of the groups they all had the same most distant known ancestor. So again, another independent variable. You group them on one variable, and then you find that they match on another variable. And thirdly, also in um, genetic family three, there was a rare marker value among all of these people. This uh, DIS449 value of 26 only occurs in 1.7% of the general population. It occurs in 0% approximately, of those in haplogroup OR1B. So again, uh, you get independent verification on the basis of genetic distance from a variety of other markers of potential relatedness. And this is why we group people together. We group people together so that we optimize the chances that we have a group that are consistently related to each other. Um, one of the question, questions I get from project members is, why do I match some members of the project, but I don't match others? So, for example, here's my dad, up in yellow here, and um, he matches five out of the 12 people in lineage two. And the match threshold there is, is four out of 37, so he'll have a zero, one, two, or three, or four out of 37 match with these people. But the non-matches, there's also five non-matches uh, in lineage two that don't turn up in his list of matches. These are separated from him by a distance of either five out of 37 or six out of 37 markers. And this, to me, is one of the most important reasons for joining a surname project as an individual, that you will actually be put in touch with people who are relevant to your family surname that don't actually show up in your list of matches on Y-DNA, on family tree DNA, because the threshold level is, um, is set at a particular level that does miss some uh, positive people that should be included in your family tree or in your family group. So this is why surname projects will tell you more than just your list of matches alone. Uh, so do join your relevant surname project. But once you have a genetically related group, and this is important because some project administrators do not group people purely on the basis of genetic distance. They will do it in terms of maybe geographic location, which is perfectly valid. It's, it's not right, it's not wrong, it's just a different method. You know, those who match each other but who came from uh, Georgia, those who match each other but came from Virginia, you know, that uh, separates the group in a totally different way from just looking at genetic relatedness. And this system of trying to reconstruct the branching pattern of the family tree going back to the origin of the surname is only really going to be possible if you use a group of people who are tightly genetically related to each other. Um, identifying branches within a genetic family, we're using uh, mutation history trees, also known as phylograms, cladograms, and um, B 
building a mutation history tree based on STR mutations. We're going to be talking about known genealogies. We're going to talk about a hand-drawn tree. We're going to talk about fluxus diagrams. And are they all consistent with each other? So if I just take the first 12 markers of lineage 2, these are all the Gleasons in lineage 2, and these are the, the markers here. You can see that there are different mutations around the place. Here's one mutation, well, the first, there's the modal haplotype up there. There are four people who match their modal haplotype exactly. That's member number one, three, four, and five. They're all an exact match. So they for, form a, their own specific group. Now, this mutation here, we can imagine that that must have represent a branching off from the main branch at some point in the past. And then if we come down to these mutations here, they could represent another branching point at some point in the past. You don't know if it occurs before this branching point here or this branch here, but we're beginning to actually split our group of Gleasons into different branches based on their DNA. Then if we come down to this group of mutations here, we can imagine that that came off at some point in time, and there are two people that have these two here, but then if you look over here, a further set of them have an additional mutation, so that there's a sub-branch that comes off that branch. And that's how you can build a hand-drawn mutation history tree. Um, that's fine at 12 markers. You can do it for 37 markers, and develop this more complex tree, and now there's additional branches shown in pink that are coming off what was the original family tree just based on the 12 markers shown in blue. And those additional pink values are there. But there are several problems with this. Um, first of all, there are parallel mutations. Here's a mutation. 464B going from 16 to 17 appears in this branch and also in this branch. Here's another uh, mutation, and that's occurring in branch number one and branch number ten. So these are parallel mutations. And then we also have another mutation that is occurring in five of the branches. So there's a lot of parallel mutations in this particular model, which raises the question, is this the best fit for the data that I have available? And also, is the resolution of 37 markers, is 37 markers enough to actually give you a, a, a reasonable representative representation of what the tree actually looks like? Um, these are questions that I don't know the answers to. Um, so I turn to Fluxus, which is a software program that can give you the maximum parsimony version of the tree. And by maximum parsimony, we mean the, the, the least number of steps to account for the data. Uh, so it's giving you kind of the best fit tree. Now, the problem with all of these models is that you can actually have a variety of different models that the data would still fit, and you don't know which is the right one. The maximum parsimony approach, which is akin to Occam's razor, the, the least number of steps um, possible to explain the data, gives you perhaps the highest probability that what you're producing is the most reflective of what it actually is in terms of your ancestry. But there's no guarantee for that. Uh, the other thing with, about fluxes is, while it can help, and it's, it's useful to check your hand-drawn tree against it, it um, is cumbersome, it's fiddly, it's easy to make mistakes, and it's difficult to visualize a family tree from this. You know, I can convert this into a family tree with an ancestor at the top and descendants at the bottom, but it's not easy, and it's difficult to interpret, and it's time-consuming. So um, thank you to Ralph Taylor, who did this work for me, and um, he is uh, one of our colleagues that we uh, talk to quite a lot. Ralph knows more about Fluxus Diagram than I ever hope I, ever, I will. So um, it's not for the faint-hearted, but it can be informative. There is a major problem, though. All of this is rubbish. Potentially rubbish because of convergence. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about convergence. It could be a spanner in the wheel. It could be a complete red herring. It could be a bit of both. Or it could be a major problem when you're doing these STR-based mutation history trees. And the reason is this. 
markers mutate, STO markers mutate, and their values change over time, and you get forward mutations, which are, if you like, away from that modal value, and you get backward mutations, which come back to the modal value. So, for example, if we started off 10,000 years ago with a single marker which had a value of, say, 8, over the course of the millennia, we find that some of the descendants of this individual, their marker value might change and go up. That's the red line above. Some of them might not change very much at all. And uh, they just change by one repeat value here, around about 7,000 years ago, and that never changed again. Some of them actually go down in value, and then they go back up in value. And that creates a major problem, because this line here, the red line, is diverging. There's a lack of divergence in the blue line, but you can see that the blue line and the green line have met up here, and they have the same value. Now, what do you immediately think if somebody has the same value as you? Well, they're probably closely related to me, right? Because we have the same value. No! You were related by a common ancestor 10,000 years ago. So, the, the, the convergence in this situation throws a massive fly in the ointment. There was also convergence back here. So, if they were doing genealogy 6,000 years ago, these uh, the descendants of the, the purple line and the green line would have had the same value, would have thought they were closely genetically related, but in actual fact, they were related by a common ancestor who lived 3,000 years ago. So, that's just an example with um, one marker, but you know, with 12 markers, there's less of a chance that you actually get that. With 25, 37, 67, 111, there's an even lesser chance. But the important thing to take away is that both back mutations, um, mutations that, uh, uh, that, that cause people to come and converge on each other, and parallel mutations will disguise the true branching pattern of the tree. So this is an example of convergence from the L22 a six a data set kindly given to me by Dennis Wright. And um, he developed one of these, uh, or one of his um, uh, project members developed a cladogram, uh, phylogram mutation history tree based upon the STR values in the L226 haplogroup project and had this wonderful branching pattern. And then one of the new SNPs came along for the L226 group and it was called, uh, let me see, FGC5628. Uh, so, how many branches, uh, you know, does it occur on just one branch? That's what you're hoping for, is that your STR base tree is correct, and then this new SNP will actually maybe define one of these branches up here, for example. Or maybe a branch down here, maybe it's going to occur there, and everybody down here will be FGC 5628. This is where FGC 5628 occurs in this tree. on virtually, there's one, two, three, four, five branches, and this is just the top half of the tree. It continues down for another four times this length. This particular SNP occurs on multiple branches of the L226 tree based on STORs. So this is, and you're going to see uh, examples of convergence in these haplogroup projects very, very frequently. It's going to be less of a problem in surname projects because the surname anchors everybody into a particular group. The L226 haplogroup project has a variety of different surnames within the group. So whereas it will be less of a problem in surname projects, it will still be problematic. And an example of that was given to me by Ali McDonald, uh, who is administrator of the uh, Stewart project. And here we have Alexander Stewart, uh, fourth high steward of Scotland, living about 1200. Then we have the high Stewart line here, and the Bunkle Stewarts in this line here. The um, high Stewarts are S781 negative, that's their SNP there, uh, 781 negative, this one is 781 positive. So this particular SNP differentiates between the two branches of the Stewart clan. But Let's have a look then at three of the participants. One was Fred Stewart, one was Earl Castle Stewart, one was Paul Thompson. Um, these was the Y chromosome position, the reference. This uh, chap here was a Bunkle. He was 7081 positive. Uh, these two here were from the High Stewarts and 7081 negative. So descendants of John Bunkle were uh, the High Stewarts carry the, um, 
were positive for the marker and the descendants of Walter Stewart, who were the high stewards, were negative for the marker. But here is the 67 marker values and here is the genetic distance. Uh, Earl Castle Stewart well, had a genetic, genetic distance of 3 out of 67 to Paul Thompson and 4 out of 67 to Fred Stewart, indicating that they were possibly very closely related. Um, but in actual fact, we know that they're not closely related. Their ancestor is not in the last couple of hundred years. Their ancestor was 1,200 in the 1,200s, and we know that from the genealogy. So if I was a project admin and I saw somebody with a genetic distance of 4 out of 67 or 3 out of 67, I would say, oh yeah, definitely put them in our lineage because they are related to us. Well, this is an example of how somebody that looks closely related actually is much more distantly related than you would expect. And it's only the SNP markers that allow you to differentiate between the uh, convergence and what is actually a close relationship. So it's probably only really a problem with dissimilar surname matches. So for example, NPEs. It could be a possible NPE within the era of, say, zero to a thousand um, uh, years before the present, so in the last thousand years. It, it could alternatively be a pre-surname match. So you have a, somebody who matches a little, matches the Gleasons. It could be from before the time of surnames, maybe a, a neighbor from that area, and you have a common ancestor going back uh, before 1000 AD. Or it could be an example of convergence, where the common ancestor is not 1,000 years ago, it's not even 2,000 years ago, it's 10,000 years ago. So you have to be really careful about this. Uh, it's potentially misleading if you use it to pinpoint your ancestral origins. So that is a very, very important consideration, and you do need to take it into account. Um, can it only be distinguished by upgrading everybody to 111 markers? Probably not, because we saw from the Stewart example that even at a high level of marker testing, you can still get convergence. Um, probably downstream SNP testing of everyone is the best way of, of uh, distinguishing between whether or not convergence is present. Um, is there a higher risk of convergence at lower levels of testing? Absolutely. 12 markers, there's lots of convergence. 25 markers, a little bit less. 37, it's there. 67, even less. 111, the lowest chance of convergence, but you haven't eliminated the risk entirely. Um, at higher levels of genetic distance, yes. It's unusual to have convergences if it's an exact match, in my estimation. Um, it's much more likely if you've got one of those kind of close to outlying matches, like 4 out of 37. I think the risk of convergence is, is higher there. Um, if you have many different surnames among your Y-DNA 37 uh, matches, then a lot of them are probably convergent. I'm talking about 25 uh, matches, 50 matches at 37 markers. A lot of them are not real matches. They're probably an example of convergence of play because of your own particular genetic signature being very close to people's genetic signatures on other branches of the human evolutionary tree. And certain haplogroups are probably more prone to this because certain haplogroups might have diverged and then converged and the finer branches might be overlapping. But we haven't done enough research to actually define which of those um, haplogroups it's likely to be. So, in this confusing picture of uh, trying to draw a mutation history tree and then being confounded by convergence, we have SNPs to the rescue, or do we? Um, we had a uh, tsunami of SNPs over the last uh, couple of years by a variety of these uh, testing companies, and um, uh, previously what we would do is we would join a haplogroup project that the administrator would look at our STR profile and advise us on what SNP we should test. And we were doing single SNP testing. But then we had the big Y coming in, we had Y Elite from FGC, a whole variety of other um, companies uh, producing these, these um, uh, SNP tests. And like I say, we only had uh, 111 STRs to deal with, we now have 50,000 SNPs to deal with. So there is a huge avalanche of these SNPs. And um, this is what the tree used to look like in 2013. Uh, we've seen from uh, Brian's presentation, from James' presentation. It's a lot more complicated than that now. And there are so many finer branches to the tree, it's practically impossible to put them on a single sheet of paper. 
So fine scale SNP testing is probably the best method of determining bran branching patterns within a genetic family. But how do we do it cheaply and as efficiently as possible? That's still a challenge because the cost of the big Y, which is the cheapest of these tests, uh, well, it's cheaper than the Y Elite one, which is up to about $800, $900, $1,000. Big Y is still $575. It's on offer here at $475, which is a great discount. And thank you, Family Tree DNA, who's listening, uh, for giving us that discount. Um, but we'd like it to be $100. Uh, so, um, yes, let's have a round of applause for that. Why not? Yes. No pressure, no pressure. So um, we live for that day uh, so we can get everybody tested. There are other challenges apart from the cost. Here's a challenge. How can I properly grade my SNP candidates? Um, okay, well, you just do that, and you do that, and you do that, and you do that, and you do that. Okay, it's highly technical. So I'm not even going to spend any time on that slide. There's a huge amount of technicalities involved in this. The other thing that um, is a challenge is that when uh, you can divide SNPs, these 50,000 SNPs, into those that we know about already and those that um, have just been discovered. And um, I'm going to get my glasses so I can keep an eye on the time. Okay. Um, the known SNPs are those that are already discovered. The new SNPs are those that have never been discovered before. And those that have never been discovered before, these new SNPs can be divided into two subgroups. Those that you share with someone else, so you're sharing a newly discovered SNP with somebody else, and those that you don't share, those that are just unique or private to you as an individual, you have your unique mutations that nobody else in the world shares with you because they haven't tested yet. And what's going to happen as more people test is that, first of all, these new SNPs, these newly discovered SNPs, will then move over into the known SNP group. And it's a little bit confusing when that happens because they don't tell us when they are moving them from one group to the other. So that's a challenge, it's confusing. The other thing that's going to happen is that as more people test, there you are, you know, proudly holding on to your unique SNPs, your private SNPs that nobody else in the world shares with you. You feel like a special person, and then somebody comes along, they share the SNPs with you, your private SNPs are ripped away from you, and you are moved up into Alex Williamson's big tree, and a whole new block of undifferentiated SNPs is added. And here's another big problem. Where do I find the most reliable SNPs? Well, not in the palindromic arms, not in the centromere, not in YQ12, not in the pseudo-autosomal region, in the highly XY homolog region, not in DZ719, in short, report, report, short repetitive elements, and not flanking short repetitive elements, not in the post-palindromic region. Well, thank you very much. It, it raises the question, when is a SNP not a SNP? It also raises the question, when is not a SNP a SNP? So there's still a lot of confusion <laughs> about uh, calling and identifying these SNPs. And um, a big question is, is a SNP really present? So for example, if it, has it been detected? No. Is it present? In actuality, no. Okay, great. You have correctly identified that a SNP is not there. That's, that's a great result. At the bottom, is a SNP detected? Yes. Is it present? Yes. So therefore, you have correctly identified a SNP that is present. That, I would love to have just those two rows in that table, but unfortunately the whole area of rows where uh, you have a conflict, uh, the SNP might be, it might, just because the SNP isn't detected doesn't mean it's not there. And also just because the SNP has not been detected doesn't mean that it is there. So there is that confusion because of uh, poor coverage of a particular area of the Y chromosome. Sometimes it's very difficult to position a test, especially in palindromic regions. It, it's either here or it's here. We just don't know. But it's either you know, in Blackrock or it's in Balls Bridge. Uh, we can't actually tell because Blackrock and Balls Bridge actually look really, really close to each other. They look exactly the same, so it's impossible to tell. Um, then there's ones like uh, low confidence SNPs and unstable SNPs that change a lot. So there's still a lot of confusion about actually saying, yes, I'm certain this is a SNP, and I'm certain that you have it, and I'm also certain that the person we are comparing you to does not. So there's still a, a lot of confusion in that regard. These are the, my big Y results. Okay, they're my dad's big Y results. We have 
his matches here. Uh, this is the number of shared novel variants. So these are the new discovered SNPs. And he shares 75 of them with new discoveries with this person, 71 with this person, etc., etc. The ones I'm interested in are the ones that have are an exact match. Known SNP differences. He has no difference at all with these first eight people. I am particularly interested in looking at them. And if I click on any of these numbers up here, then what I get is this wonderful pop-up box that shows me all 59 common um, SNPs shared with that particular person. And what I do then, and what Lisa Little, one of my project members, has done, copy that into an Excel spreadsheet and do that for each of the exact matches, each of the eight exact matches. And uh, this one just shows the ones that, uh, he, um, that, that uh, are not shared with uh, my dad's results. The important thing here is to realize that your big Y results are first of all looked at by the surname administrator of the project, then the haplogroup administrators, uh, and we have the Z255 group down here, Neil Downing and John Murphy, James Kane is the CTS446, and we also have the Z255 Yahoo group who discusses it online. So there's a huge amount of collaboration going on. We're also lucky to have Alex Williamson, who does The Big Tree, Nigel McCarthy, who is an administrator of the Munster Irish Project, and we've also sent the family tree DNA results to YFUL for a reinterpretation. And what we're getting is, this is our spreadsheet, we've generated this ourselves, and again, I'm just showing you the colors, but here is a clue. Um, e. Gleason and P. Gleason are identified by these uh, yellow SNPs here. Nobody else in the group has these SNPs. H. Gleason and uh, Mr. Little have this particular pink snip up here, and that's that one up there. Uh, M. Gleason, that's my dad, H. Gleason and Little also have these green snips, which are these ones here. And then the Gleason specific snips, and these are, this, these are probably the snips that define the Gleason surname until some interloper comes along and tests and we define that actually no, half of them belong to the Carols. Um, they're in the orange, so it's these SNPs here are shared just by Gleason's and nobody else in the world at the moment. So as mo more people test, that will change. And then we've got SNPs that are further upstream uh, in, in the human evolutionary tree. From this, we can generate a pedigree. There's the most distant SNP there, and as we come along, we can break it down. You can see that a branching pattern is beginning to emerge. Also, the Z255 group have their own version of the branching pattern. The Gleason's are up here. These are the Gleason specific SNPs here. Little Gleason, 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 Gleason. And you can see that the two, even within Gleason, were spread, splitting into two separate groups. This is Alex Williamson's tree, and the Gleason's are over here. We've got a nice little group of five uh, in this diagram. Since this was taken, we have an extra Gleason. And the exciting thing is that the Gleason has been proven to be genetically related to the Gleason. So uh, that was a major uh, find because the surname dictionaries will tell you that Gleason was a surname from the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. We've actually shown now that it is actually genetically related to the main Gleason branch. Um, here's a close-up of the Gleason uh, branch on Alex's tree. If you click on any of these... Um, uh, names here, you get some wonderful readouts of um, the people. And here's Alex's summary of the SNPs uh, markers for this particular area uh, for uh, one, two, three, four, five, six people. Uh, there's a Carol who is quite close to us, but he branched off before the Gleasons. Um, and that just gives you an idea of these are the SNPs here with their position and this is where they fit in the actual tree. So we're beginning to see a branching pattern. Another challenge, for me at least anyway, is these long numbers. These indicate the position of the SNP marker on the Y chromosome. They will eventually be christened with a name like I5631, which I find uh, less of a mouthful to say than those long numbers. Um, but there is confusion over the naming pattern. Different people call the same thing different names. Thank you, I don't need that confusion. Please, let's sort ourselves out. So, another challenge to the, for the novice. Um, the currently unique SNPs among Gleason uh, members, and here's two of them here, 
So uh, this particular uh, member here, 338070, has three unique SNPs. That's uh, that person down there. Uh, the little, which is probably an NPE, uh, she reckons that there was a Gleason involved uh, with some ancestor back in the mists of time, also have three private SNPs, and this one is 60393. Uh, this one over here, and then there's another one, there's my dad actually, he's got all of these unique private SNPs, or at least private for now, unique for now, until somebody else joins the project and we find that actually no, we, you're going to have to give back some of those SNPs because they're shared with somebody else. Um, the, this is what came back with the Y full analysis, and again, these are my dad's results, um, he's, we, he's got five best quality SNPs, you know, confident that these are real and not imaginary SNPs, and then he's got 11 ambiguous SNPs. These are based only on two calls, whereas these would be based on somewhere between 50 to 70 calls. So in other words, uh, the machine has actually scanned these ones about 70, the, the, the region of the chromosome about 70 times, and it's reasonably certain it's found them 70 times in that region. Uh, these SNPs have, have been in an area of the chromosome that's only been scanned twice, but they came up both times. Slightly less reliable, perhaps, than the uh, high-confidence ones. But have a look at this. If we compare Alex's analysis with the Y-full analysis, uh, okay, yeah, okay, that one is the same. So the first one's okay. Yeah, that one's the same as well. And then the third one, okay, that's down there, that's fine. And the fourth one, that's down there. Okay, that's on the list. Fine, that's on the list. What about this one? Nope, 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 nope. So there is, there is conflict between the different interpretations of the different um, people. And Alex has identified some SNPs that Yful has not identified and vice versa. So it's kind of different strokes for different folks, or as I like to say, different snips from different lips. <laughs> Who is right? We don't know. So this is one of the challenges that still faces us in this particular arena. Now I'm going to check the time again. Okay, I'm running out of time rapidly. I will go through this very quickly then. This just summarizes the STR markers that you've seen previously in the Lineage 2 family tree. But rather than showing you that diagram again, we've just taken the relevant ones out of that particular tree and put it into an Excel spreadsheet. When we incorporate STR markers into the mix, then we get a, a much different kind of uh, family tree. And this was a... Um, process that was pioneered by Nigel McCarthy. <clears throat> He's the first person that I know that actually has taken SNP markers, and these are the ones in, in black up here, um, and also then added STR markers. And he's produced this wonderful tree. He's got our, our Gleasons in here because we happen to be uh, in an area of interest to his McCarthy project. And his best guess is that the McGleasons and his well, one branch of his McCarthys were actually related somewhere between 500 and 1000 AD. So it's amazing what we're beginning to be able to do. But, but uh, Nigel pioneered this method, and our project member, Lisa Little, took it a step further and applied it to every Gleason in the tree. So what we have here now is the Gleason-specific SNPs, which were the orange ones in that uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet. We then have uh, some specific uh, SNPs down here shared with, well, on this particular branch, but there's nobody else in that branch that's taken the big Y test. And then we have a group of people over here who are defined by uh, this SNP for the entire group, and then this SNP just for these people here. And this now is beginning to look much more like a, mu a combined mutation history tree slash family history tree. And to that, we can add our ancestors. Here are the ancestors for this person here. Here are the ancestors for this person here, and so on and so on. The important thing here is that now, just like a Christmas tree, we're able to hang our baubles onto the branches of the tree. And this is where we want to be. We want to actually see if we can find out the branching pattern, which branches are more closely related to each other, so they can go back to documentary research, and it'll help focus their research to see if they can define who is this common ancestor at the branching point up here? Who is this common ancestor up here? How about up here? The other thing that we can do is we can actually use the SNPs to date the tree and date the branching patterns. 
in a very crude way, okay? This one is about 550 years ago, so you can say that these people here and these people here are possibly related around about 1400. The common ancestor was about 1400. Now, there will be large margins of error on either side of that estimate. Estimate. But we are getting to a point where that estimate will get uh, more accurate as time goes on. And uh, one of the big questions that I have is that if we add in the additional 400 markers that Y full are going to give us, will that give us enough granularity to really define the branching pattern of the tree, to really say to people, the likelihood is, based on the evidence, that you, your two branches, are related by somebody who is three generations higher than your brick walls in your respective trees. That would be a fascinating thing to do. These people here related maybe around about 1,200, assuming that the uh, average date of birth was about 1950. And the other thing that I want to do also is to hang, is I've encouraged my members to write MDKA profiles, most distant known ancestor profiles, and the sort of information that I want in those profiles are additional markers of possible relatedness. And they include STORs and SNPs, that's fine, we'll get them from the project, the location, where was your ancestor born, where did they die, the religion, because religion gets passed down in families. So two Presbyterian Gleason branches are more likely to be related than a Presbyterian and a Catholic Gleason branch. Also occupation, because occupations were frequently passed through families. Uh, my O'Carrolls were a dynasty of pawnbrokers in the Midlands during the 1830s. Um, the nickname, very, very important for the Gleason clan, because if you, if you throw a stone and hit a Gleason, you know, it's better if you actually know which Gleason you've hit. So the Gleasons have nicknames in Tipperary's, so do the Ryans. Um, who else has um, family nicknames or agnomens in their, in their family trees? A few people, okay, yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm a Gleason Macavaddy, a Gleason Helper, or a Gleason Rabbit. The reason why I'm a Gleason Rabbit potentially is because there was one branch of Gleasons that used to kill rabbits and then they'd cycle around with the dead rabbits on their uh, handlebars of their bicycle and they'd sell them for a shilling a go and uh, they get a lot of money for a dead rabbit. So um, uh, the particular branch of that uh, Gleason clan were the Gleason Rabbits. So are we close to this kind of diagram? Well, we're, we're getting there. It's a huge collaborative effort Thank you has to go out to Lisa, Neil, John, James, Alex, Nigel. There is a host of people working behind the scenes to help us understand how to analyze this data. Are we there yet? No. We need more people to test. But then, that's something we always say. How many people do we need to test? I mean, what is enough? James talked about the penetration of 0.12%, you know, one in a thousand of the living descendants today. Do we need that many? Do we need more? You know, what, what is the ideal number? We don't know. Um, will additional markers give, or fi give us finer resolution? I'm sure they will. Will they give us enough re resolution? Well, I don't know. I mean, if there are 80,000 Gleasons in the world today, how much resolution do you need from STR and SNP markers to actually divide them into branches efficiently and effectively and accurately? I don't know. Will additional markers give finer resolution? Yes. How many do we need? Are the 500 STR markers we have, are they going to be enough? Are the 50,000 SNP markers that we have, are they going to be enough? We simply don't know the answers to these questions at this point in time, but you can see that we're heading in that direction. And of course, at the end of the day, DNA is a pointer. It points you back to your documentary research. We still need to overlay that documentary data on top of the DNA data. And that is problematic because some members of our projects do not supply their pedigrees or their pedigrees are incomplete. Some people are just starting off on their family trees and they just don't know. And that's just the way it is. That's uh, the, the state of the nation, if you like. We also need to add markers of potential relatedness to the, to the most distant known ancestor profile. We perhaps need to take a one-name study approach, which is going to be a huge job for common surnames, and that means collecting all of the documentary data worldwide, uh, uh, assigning it to different individuals and creating family trees from that, and then you're left with a bunch of orphan records that you can work with and say, okay, the most likely family that this belongs to has to be, by a process of elimination, this family over here. 
That's a huge amount of work, and it would be great if we could automate it. So there is a need, need for relational databases such as Access. I have, uh, haven't a clue how to use Access. I don't have that level of technical ability. Who does? I don't know. Who is going to make it easy for us so the, the average jobbing genealogist can come along and go, oh, I just pushed this button here? Thanks. That's what I'd like to have. You just push a button and then it gives you the answer. But it ain't that easy. Um, the subtitle of this talk is How I Gave Up Drink and Switched to Valium. So um, uh, that is the state of uh, my particular uh, journey. Um, thank you very much for listening. If there's any questions, I will be very happy to address them. Thank you. Okay. We have, uh, I'm going to ask um, Brad, could you volunteer to um, uh, use the microphone? We have a question from John there at the back. It's just if I move beyond the speakers, you're liable to be blasted with this. Uh... Ooh, John? Thank yes, thank you, Morris. A fantastic, sort of very inspirational show. I think in some ways, although you, James, I know have got some slight differences in what we're doing, we're all moving in the same direction to the same goal. And I think it's been very um, useful to hear both of talks today in these directions in the next go. There's one quick clarification and one quick question. Clarification on the difference between the white fool and the big tree that you showed here. I think that you actually have a very consistent result between the two. The reason is that Alex Williamson is working from family tree DNA VCF files, All right. which have a cut of 10 reads. So nothing below 10 reads we show in those files. Whereas Wifel are pulling out the, the very marginal reads, including, as you say, these two readers, they are the ambiguous reads, and the two readers not enough to be sure you have a, a result there. That's why they're classed as being ambiguous. And you wouldn't see the truths that actually um, What's interesting, though, is what Wifel do with the um, three to nine reads. Um, are they read enough to be interesting? I think they're quite right to flag them up because it's good to know that they're there, but how, how reliable clause they are, I don't know. The question I have is, Thank you. Um, having um, gone through the process of putting SNPs onto your previously SDR-based tree, you showed us earlier how you have many multiple STR reads all over the place. Do you still have that? Or maybe have repeat STR reads even, even more than you have before you put SNPs on the tree? That's something I have to, to look at, um, and I would have done it if my computer hadn't crashed on Friday. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that is something that I want to do, is to look at the historical developments of the trees over time as more uh, markers are discovered and are added uh, to, the, um, to the tree. I'm working, the, the, these slides are actually out of date because we have, they, they were done like two months ago, but since then, things have moved on. And uh, what I'm imagining is that this will be a dynamic process and I'll be changing the tree with the advent of every new big Y results from a new tester to the project. And this Glisten uh, member has, uh, is likely to change everything. Alex has been sent his files, so has Nigel, uh, Y full as well, and now it's just a question of waiting for their analysis. But um, yeah, this is going to be very dynamic. And I think uh, one of the uh, follow-on uh, exercises I have to do is to look at the 37 marker tree that Flux has generated, the maximum parsimony tree, the best fit tree, and just to see how the best fit tree based on STR data changes when you actually add SNPs and which branches are completely wrong and which branches were spot on. So that's an analysis that still needs to be done but a very worthwhile analysis and very informative. Thank you for that question. Yes, uh, I'm trying to get to one more presentation today, if uh, time allows. Is there any other questions? <laughs> if, uh, wh yes. one question here. Yeah, we'll take this last question and then that's it. Documentary evidence. Uh, uh, there are two poets in Country Britain, actually, in the 18th century. Now, one was from Herberstown and one was from Askaten. One was what he assigned in his manuscript, and the other was our Uh huh. So I was just wondering, is that type of information of any... Oh, absolutely. In, in, in comparing with the DNA? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, uh, this is a marker of potential relatedness, because not only do you have people with two variants of the same surname, but they also have the same occupation. 
So they were both poets as well. And we know that from in ancient Ireland that uh, occupations were passed down through families. So this could be a very, very important piece of information from the ancient genealogies. And that's why we need people like Cathy Swift and um, other people who are experts on these ancient genealogies to inform us about these wonderful nuggets of information that will be very important for our surname research. Thank you for that question. One from James. Just in case people were worried about what I was saying earlier on, it was music to my ears to hear that you reached many similar conclusions to mine by a completely different route. It was music to mine to hear you had the same conclusions as mine, so I was much relieved. It's difficult to express, to quantify, to, to explain to others how we do it. And it's a very different language, but I can see the commonalities. I just want to say that so people don't think we are pulling in different directions. Sure, sure. No, that's a very good point, um, because we are all kind of pioneers, you know, and, and James used the wonderful analogy of being Christopher Columbus and finding a new snip and having the most glorious feeling of elation. Uh, because you are there on the crest of the wave of scientific discovery. And everybody in this room is on the crest of the wave of scientific discovery, which is what makes this hobby so exciting and uh, why we come back here and volunteer our time and why half of us are on Valium. Uh, you know, it, it, it's because we are enthusiastic about it. So I'm going to uh, leave it there. My thanks to John, my thanks to James, my thanks to everybody in the audience for actually inspiring us to keep on doing what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.